Welcome to everybody. Um, so hello, and um, this is our first Opus webinar for 2022, so great to see you all here. Uh, I would like to begin today by paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm zooming in from today, that's Jagera country, close to the border with Turbul country. Um, I pay my respects to the elders past and present of these lands, and I also recognise the land rights of traditional custodians right across Australia, uh, acknowledging that sovereignty has never been ceded. Uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution that First Nations people make to our university and to our own research here at OPUS. Now, it is my pleasure today to introduce Ken Knight. Um, Ken Knight is the Research Impact Manager at the Murdoch Children's Institute. Um, he is an award-winning practice specialist and educator in the fields of knowledge translation, engagement and research impact. Uh, Ken has over a decade's professional experience in research, health and government, complemented by postgraduate qualifications in psychology, communications and cultural theory. Uh, he's passionate about partnering with diverse stakeholders to facilitate greater impact and establishing and evaluating organizational models and processes that enable research evidence to be useful and utilized. So Ken, I might pass over to you to explain how you would like today to run. Um, and thank you again for your time and, and joining us today. Thanks, Sam, and, and for the generous introduction. And, and also thanks to Michelle and Manny, who are behind the scenes, making uh, making everything work very seamlessly for us all. And good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be involved in this program and great to have the opportunity to speak with you about uh, this complex, sometimes thorny and irritating topic of research impact uh, today. Uh, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country on which I live and work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So forewarning, today will be something of a whirlwind overview. We've, we're going to cover quite a bit of ground. Hopefully it'll be a bit of a degustation of um, tools and tips and processes to whet your appetite uh, around progressing and approaching research impact in a sustainable uh, and meaningful and workable way. Um, there will be a, a recording and slides made available. A whole range of resources are also uh, available for you to continue this progress um, uh, in your own work. Um, and, and a lot of the content will touch upon uh, and, and expand upon earlier concepts that have been covered in this webinar series. Uh, we're a small group, so I'd like to keep this informal. Um, uh, and, and you can see that we're using Zoom meeting rather than webinar. Uh, I will be presenting with slides for most of today's session, but I will be breaking it up with lots of pauses so you can ask questions and we can discuss anything that may not be as clear as it could be. As Sam mentioned, I'd also like to keep this session as interactive as we possibly can, but I also understand that not everyone is able to be as interactive as they could be or feels comfortable uh, interacting in these kind of sessions. So if that's the case for you um, in the interactive bits, if you just keep your mic and your uh, video off, we will respect respectfully get the picture and we won't badger you uh, to engage. So, so please don't feel like you need to leave the session if you can't or don't want to engage with us. Uh, but the reason behind that interactivity is really uh, a kind of a kind of a core founding tenant of, of the work for me and that we approach this and I think we can only really approach this meaningfully as a community of practice. All of us bring great uh, and diverse knowledge and lived experience to these processes and practices and I think that the only way that we can meaningfully progress and advance our learning and understanding is to do it as a collective. So I'm certainly not uh, sitting here in front of you saying that I'm the expert in these processes and principles. I bring uh, diverse knowledge and skills, but I also look to you to share your reflections and your knowledge and your skills and your practices. I'm sure you have um, engaged in these processes in, in a whole range of really interesting ways. So please, throughout today's session, if you um, would like to share your reflections and your skills and experience and what, what's happened well for you or maybe not so well for you, please don't hold back and, and, and you can do that via the chat at any point. So to kick us off, I'm also very curious about, about who you are and, and how you're coming to this work. And so I'd like to start with a couple of polls uh, just to gauge where you're up to. So bear with me while I put this up. So I've got two questions here. The first one is, do you currently plan for and or assess your research impact? And then the second one is around how you would rate your understanding of research impact. So we'll just give you a few seconds 
to see how you go and then we'll share your responses. Thank you, your responses are streaming in. Fantastic, thank you. And let me share these results. So we can see a pretty, pretty even spread, at least around uh, what you're currently doing. 29% um, of you uh, do plan for and assess your research impact, 59% know, and a few of you are unsure. And in terms of your current knowledge, uh, we've got a few people who have a good understanding, a few people who have a basic understanding, and a few people who this is pretty new to. And I, I, that was what I was expecting. I think this is relatively consistent when we talk about research impact and knowledge translation. I probably suspect that your level of understanding is a bit more advanced than you're giving yourselves credit for. I think one thing that we find when we're talking about research impact and knowledge translation is that often uh, these terms are used very variably and interchangeably. And sometimes we're talking about these things or doing these things and not necessarily really giving ourselves credit for, for doing impact and translation work. But just to expand on this a bit, I'm, I'd like to now um, just take a moment to have a quick breakout room activity. And Manny's gonna allocate you all into some breakout rooms. And I'd like you to respond uh, to the key question of what does impact mean for you? And what's your key impact challenge? And this is just to get us, this is just to get us started. Um, and then we will come back and we'll share some responses. Again, if you're not comfortable participating in this way, uh, just keep your mic and your video off. And as I said, we will respectfully uh, acknowledge your boundaries and not pressure you to engage. So Manny, if you can, if you can break people into some breakout rooms to have a quick conversation, that would be brilliant. Welcome back everyone. I hope that that was uh, an interesting, if, if maybe a bit too short, <laughs> opportunity to have a chat. Would anybody like to share any of, any of the reflections or any of the insights or any of the challenges that were discussed in your rooms? Please just, just unmute and jump in. What does impact mean to you and, and what are some of the challenges that you spoke about? I can start. We Thanks, Carl. Said, depending a bit on your field for people in the basic research or not, a fundamental research impact can be citations or evidence of use of research, which again is citations or patents or things like that. For those in the more applied or translational spectrum, transition to practice, changes in practice. Um, there was also impact was also demonstration of integrity, reproducibility of the work, which now is becoming more important, I think, than ever, or more considered than it ever was clearly describing evidence of use and I guess how is this best done and that determined somewhat by the field whether it's citations or demonstrable evidence of implementation um, and then communicating the findings and making sure the target audience gets access to that information and uses it as evidence of uh, utilization of the research. Thank you Carl. Would anyone else like to share? Maybe Ken and I can jump in from our yeah, group. Yeah. We talked about different types of impact and we were following that framework that the NHMRC sort of lay out of, of um, knowledge impact, health impact, social impact or, or economic impact. Mm -hmm. um, and we also had um, a really great point raised around the difference between, well, I, I think it was a great point around impact versus significance as well mm -hmm. and what's the difference yeah. there. And so, I mean, the way that I think about it when I'm writing a grant is, is around impact being what you've done in the past and maybe significance more with a potential significance, maybe more forward facing. I don't know if that's correct or not, yeah. but those are some of the discussions that we had in our breakout room. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, everyone. And I think all really um, relevant and rich reflections. And I encourage you to keep those thoughts in mind because we're going to revisit those questions at the end of the session just to see whether our subsequent conversation um, it kind of fleshes any of that out or maybe challenges uh, any of any of any precon preconceptions or, or hopefully maybe enlightens um, uh, some, some maybe misconceptions or uh, some areas that you think may be murky or not as well uh, thought through um, as they could be. So bear with me, I'm going to share my screen now um, and launch into the, the didactic bit of today's presentation. But as I said, we will pause uh, in a number of places uh, for um, uh, questions and please feel free uh, to pose any questions or reflections as we go in the chat and Sam will keep an eye on those. So 
Can I just get a thumbs up that you can see my screen and my slides? All well, perfectly, brilliant. So today we're gonna to give a bit of an overview about what we actually mean when we talk about impact and translation. And then I'm gonna talk through some evidence-informed approaches uh, that make this work hopefully meaningful um, and purposeful and practical and feasible for you all. Now, if this seems like a bit of a whirlwind, it's because what I'm doing today is condensing uh, some key messages from what is uh, an eight-part course that I run across the Melbourne Children's Campus. Um, but don't feel overwhelmed by this. That's, this is, again, like, you know, the kind of the highlights reel of, of these principles and, and processes. Uh, but there are a whole range of resources that are associated with each of these, and I will be sharing them. Uh, we also have an impact hub on the, on the Royal Children's Hospital website, which I will share with you after today's session. And if you have any feedback or questions about the content that I cover, uh, please let Sam and, and, and Manny and Michelle know, and we'll make sure that we provide a bit of a tailored overview. So what I like to do when I'm talking about impact is, is take one giant step back and think a little bit more around the reasons that as a health and medical research community and as a research community in general, we're being asked and encouraged to think about impact. Uh, you know, what's all the fuss? What are we actually talking about? And for me and for my program and for the work that I do across Melbourne Children's and at the university, it kind of hinges around four key and interlinked challenges. And the first one is around time lags. We know uh, that it takes an average of 17 years to move 14% of research into policy and practice. Now, this is an often cited statistic and it's in some ways contested, but I think the take home here is that it takes too long to move too little into action. Linked to this, is a very large amount of research waste and waste in health and medical research due to a failure to translate has been estimated at over 85%. Now these challenges have uh, unsurprising clinical implications. We know that there is an underuse of effective care and an overuse of ineffective care in our health system. And so for me, in fact, the program at Melbourne Children's, these four factors really compel us to think of new and innovative ways to tackle what are wicked and complex problems, to optimize research impact and increase our understanding, to ultimately improve health and the health system. And maybe more pragmatically, and maybe more uh, definitely a kind of a thorn in your side at the moment, increasingly research funders are mandating a focus on research impact. And this generally takes one of two forms, uh, track record or retrospective impact, tell us how you've been impactful in the past, make that robust and verify those claims with, uh, with independently uh, sourced information that people can check with, uh, or tell us how you're going to have an impact in the future. And I guess this is kind of getting to that question that Sam raised around impact versus significance. And we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that in a little bit. But I think this is often uh, how researchers are being encouraged and driven to think about impact in a purposeful and practical way. But what are we actually talking about? Uh, and Sam mentioned the NHMRC's uh, definition uh, previously. Uh, and I like this definition because it is inclusive. But the NHMRC, for those of you who may be unfamiliar, uh, they talk about the verifiable outcomes that research makes to knowledge, health, the economy or society. They refer to impact as the effect of the research after it has been adopted, adapted for use, or used to inform further research. And the reason that I said I like this and it's inclusive is because other definitions of research impacts, for example, the ARC definition of research impact, isn't particularly concerned or interested in uh, contributions to knowledge and academia. And I think that that can unfairly uh, hamstring our lab and discovery focused researchers. Um, so so I, I, quite like, I quite like this definition. But I'd also encourage you to think of other definitions within uh, and other frameworks and other processes within our context. Uh, and so I would like to point out the Asso Association of Australian Medical Research Institute's research impact framework, which was launched in May last year. And this is the first impact framework for the Australian health and medical research community. Now, this framework provides 87 indicators of, of impact across six broad categories. And these are around improving knowledge, so measures of research quality, activity, outreach and structure, asking what was discovered or what was unique uh, and innovative and what methodologies enabled those discoveries. Research capacity building, so developing researchers and research infrastructure and having the right skills and the tools to do the research job and the research work brilliantly. Informing decision making, decisions about health and healthcare, including public health and social care, decisions about future research investment and decisions by the public. 
health impact. I think this is maybe often if we're if we're working in clinical context, this is where we first, uh, I think, like to think our, our impact will go. But these are, so this is including improved health outcomes, determinants of health, and improved health system. Economic impact, including commercialization, efficiencies and cost savings and social impact, including participation, health and welfare in the community, and improved understanding. So these uh, indicators or these broad uh, areas of research impact adapt and expand the well-validated Canadian Academy of Health Sciences model from 2009. And I like this particularly uh, because I think for all of us, whether we are researchers, whether we're students, whether we're health professionals, or, or whether we're professional staffs who support research activities, I think we can all see our work uh, contributing to one or more of these areas. And I think everyone has a home in this broad and inclusive view of research impact. And I will send you a link uh, to this framework if, if, if you would, if you'd be interested in looking at it in more detail. But what all of this is, is trying really in a concerted way to get us to do is move our thinking and our emphasis beyond our outputs, so our publications, our, our presentations, our reports, and our publication metrics to a focus on the benefits and the changes arising from our research. So while our publication metrics may be very important indicators of reach and engagement, the real importance there is that others picked up our research and built upon it and expanded upon it uh, and that it was relevant and informed a discipline in that way. Uh, so I think that that's an important distinction to think about when we're thinking about metrics, but we can also uh, talk about that in some more detail. Another conceptual uh, kind of tool that I'd like to think um, is relevant here is some work that, that my team developed uh, adapting from Guthrie and colleagues from 2013 around what are the kind of the core drivers. We have seen an international movement in research that focuses on research impact. And, and these are some of those core drivers in those approaches. Of course, starting from the top right here, we wanna see acceleration. We wanna see an increase in the speed and efficiency of the application of research. We want to demonstrate responsible and effective use of funding we receive. We want to increase the accessibility of our research findings. We want to increase awareness and demonstrate the value of our research. We want to ensure and monitor progress and inform the future allocation of resources and make sure that that's responsible and sustainable. And I think maybe most importantly, uh, we want to build understanding of the reasons for the success or failure of research impact so that we can create a learning system and so that we can do impact more effectively uh, and more efficiently and more responsibly uh, into the future. Before I pause for questions, I'd also like to show you this diagram. And so uh, this is based on uh, an analysis of the Research Excellence Framework 2014 findings. So the Research Excellence Framework is the United Kingdom's research impact uh, framework. Uh, and this is some data and some, and some um, uh, analysis that was done by King's College London. But the take home here for you is that impact pathways are unique. So this group of researchers analyzed 6,700 impact case studies uh, and they identified 3,709 unique pathways to impact. Uh, and so I think here we need to acknowledge uh, that there is no one or correct way or process or methodology to achieving research impact. This will look different inevitably based on your context, your need and what you're trying to achieve in the world. Uh, so, so take heart. Uh, there, there is no um, paint by numbers approach to this. Um, that, that is kind of liberating, but it is also, I understand, uh, sometimes complex and daunting. So I'm just going to pause now to see if we've got any questions. And Sam, do we have any, any questions or comments in the chat? No questions, comments in the chat yet, but please everyone feel free to, to type them in or if you'd like to raise your hand or unmute yourself. Right, we will forge bravely forward, um, but there will be other points where we stop in, in the midst of this, uh, of this presentation. So I, I guess the question here is, you know, what is our conceptual in? So I've kind of given a bit of grounding into that, you know, why we're, why we're talking about impact. But I think now what's, what's kind of underlying this and, and how can we approach this work in an informed and rigorous way? And for me and, and for, for my program and when I'm encouraging researchers to think about this, really knowledge translation and all of the, 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 the work that is that encompassed by that umbrella term is, is the response. And knowledge translation refers to the dynamic and interactive processes involved in raising awareness of knowledge and facilitating its use. This is a definition from the World Health Organization and they importantly talk about knowledge translation uh, as involving synthesis, 
an exchange, an application. Synthesis in the sense of bringing together all of the available knowledge, not just research evidence, practice wisdom and lived experience, having some kind of dialogue in terms of exchange with different beneficiaries, end users, other researchers, clinicians, around what this means in particular contexts. What can we do with this? What are, what are, the, what are the problems and what are the responses that we should be engaging with here? And then applying that knowledge in particular ways, be it to uh, inform further research, be it to change practice, be it to change awareness, be it to raise knowledge and awareness. A linked concept, but distinct concept and field is implementation science. And so implementation science involves the scientific study of methods to promote the systematic uptake of research findings and other evidence-based practices, principally in clinical practice. It's often used and sometimes increasingly used in other fields, but this is a, a paradigm and a process that has evolved to, to inform and enrich uh, clinical practice and clinical work. And, and we can talk a little bit more about that if that would be of interest to you moving on. But these are two distinct but related and underpinning methodologies and areas of practice and research specialization in themselves that underpin good approaches to research impact. I'd also like to introduce you, if you're unfamiliar with this term, but integrated knowledge translation. And so integrated knowledge translation is an approach that integrates the principles of translation throughout the entire research process. Uh, more traditional approaches to translation wait until the end and then we communicate. But integrated knowledge translation is about involving uh, stakeholders and users as partners throughout the research process. And the theory here, which is backed up increasingly by the evidence around effectiveness, is that by engaging knowledge users and actively collaborating, we increase the relevance, the credibility and the impact of our research. So that's, I guess, kind of a little bit more detail around the conceptual underpinning, but where do we practically and feasibly start? And a question that I am often asked by, by our researchers and our clinicians is what actually works? Like, you know, what does the evidence tell us uh, in terms of effectiveness here? And my maybe somewhat annoying response is, well, look, really, it depends. Because what we are actually asking when we ask what works is what works in this situation for these people in this context and with these constraints. When we're talking about translation and implementation and impact, we're referring to complex practices that require skill and situational judgment, which comes from experience, as well as evidence of what works. That said, there are a range of research syntheses uh, and, and articles which highlight uh, KT, particular knowledge translation strategies and their effectiveness, and I can send you those, but I would encourage you to be very specific and not just rely upon uh, simple tools and processes, but think about what will work uh, with, with the people that you're working with in your context and with full acknowledgement that you may have limited time, limited money and, and limited staff power to kind of do the work that you might need to do and want to do. That said, over the course of my work across the Melbourne Children's Campus and at the University and the Royal Children's Hospital, we've developed a whole range of what we're calling key ingredients for impact. And first and fundamentally, know why you're doing the research and begin in, with the end in mind. Be very clear from the outset about the problem that your research addresses and where you're hoping to get to at the end of your work, what meaningful contribution you're going to make to that wicked, gnarly challenge uh, with, with, as I said, your context and your resources. I'll get to this in a little bit more detail, but a key planning and conceptual tool, not just for conceptualizing your impact, but then also assessing your efforts is program logic. And so engage with program logic as a key tool. As I've already mentioned, identify, understand and involve your stakeholders, your consumers and your research users throughout and draw upon the rich body of theoretical and framework support that we have to guide our efforts here. Share your research findings in ways that are useful and usable and use your, your, your insight from your stakeholders to make sure that what you are doing is going to reach the audiences that you're attending to, 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 to reach. And of course, build in assessment, uh, learning and reflection. Share your impact widely and draw upon your supports. Uh, and, and by supports, I mean the university supports, uh, the, the grant supports that you have, your librarians, uh, but also one another who are all actively interested in these questions and this field. I think the other thing that I would encourage you to do is not just think about impact from an assessment angle. I think much of the discourse on impact is assessment driven. It's about rigorously measuring and describing the impact of our research once that impact has occurred. Now that is extraordinarily important, 
but I think a more meaningful and purposeful approach is one of impact by design. Uh, all of the processes, structures, planning activities and support that enables and lays the evidence-based foundations for achieving greater research impact. All of the things that we need to be doing at the beginning and throughout that make impact more likely. And I think that these are often the things that we have much more control over and can seek greater support around. Uh, I'm working currently with a whole range of NHNMRC investigator grant applicants who are in some ways uh, quite um, frustrated about trying to retrofit impact assessment processes for the purposes of a grant, particularly when they've not built in these kind of processes and questions or been supported to build in these questions and processes throughout their research. It's always easier and much more meaningful if you, if you start early. I think the other thing that we need to um, really think about here is, is the inherent complexity and challenges in this work. Uh, and, and one of the key things that I would encourage you and caution you not to do is impact wash. Uh, and so impact washing uh, is a term that stems from, from green washing or rainbow washing. Uh, this is kind of used quite interchangeably now, but, but is a label used to describe uh, things that, that, that may make themselves seem bigger and more effective and more impactful than they actually are. And I would really encourage you not to allow that to become our impact culture. Uh, if you see or hear people who seem to be impact washing, uh, I, I would politely challenge them on that. The other key challenge that we face in this work uh, is around attribution. We've already talked about the attribution time lag, that the time that it takes for our work to inform change and application. But I also think that we need to acknowledge that often our efforts are combining with a whole range of other efforts to affect meaningful change in the real world. We're rarely soloists in this work. We are most often singing as a choir. Uh, and, and I think that we need to encourage uh, greater sophistication around acknowledgement of that. And I think we need to ask some key questions about our own impact when we know that research builds incrementally over time and it's not just us who are changing the world by ourselves but we are we are contributing to off what often are quite large global efforts around particular uh, research areas or, or particular health conditions um, and so what is our impact when research builds incrementally when research is large multidisciplinary multi-center and collaborative and particularly when change is led by others so unless we're clinician researchers and we can apply our research findings in our own clinical context often we are passing the research baton to other actors and so at what point do we need to start acknowledging them as key drivers of change and not just acknowledging uh, and, and incorporating maybe impact washing uh, for, our, for our own purposes. I also think we need to acknowledge that, that impact planning and assessment is a resource-hungry resource process. It requires skill and time. And I guess we have, an, we have an active question within our organizations around who does the work and what burden do we place on our stakeholders in terms of giving us data and feedback if we're wanting to see change. I also think that there's a linked question here around what about the research? And an active question in my program is to what extent is engagement and networking and communication and dissemination and implementation and assessment now being acknowledged as the core work of researchers? That this isn't just adjacent to research, but this is a fundamental way of the way that we are doing our work. And I, I think that increasingly researchers are being expected to do this work. If that's the case, my other question then is, do our systems and processes recognize and reward this work? Because if they don't, we then see very clear disincentives uh, for researchers to engage. And, and I, would in, I, would, I would assume that I think um, many of our processes uh, don't recognize this work as well as they should. I also think we need to think about negative impact here uh, and acknowledge that science and technology and scholarship have not always been forces of good or of social benefit. Uh, and, and, and acknowledge that there's often a positivity bias when we're talking about impact, which may not be uh, genuine or accurate. I also think questions about impact bring value judgments to the fore. Often people frame their, their impact in terms of economic uh, return on investment, but that doesn't always sit well or comfortably with people or is even particularly uh, relevant or salient to the work that you're trying to do in the world. What about equity? What about justice? Uh, I, I will leave those questions uh, with you. Can I also pause here uh, to see whether anyone has any questions or reflections over that content that I just covered? Um, I guess I would say all of this is 
actually very interesting to hear, but I guess many of us are wanting to know how we craft impact, not necessarily all the, uh, and I think we need to understand all this to get a feel for that. I was just wondering if we're going to venture more into that aspect. Of Thank you, Carl. Yes, and, and we are about to head into the practical side of approaching impact, but I think having worked in this space for more than 12 years, I think we, we really need to have a solid grounding of, of, of that theoretical complexity to do this work well, because I think often we find ourselves in, and I think the onus is up to us as researchers and, and, and research leaders to advocate within our organizations around what responsible approaches to impact look like. And so we, I, I firmly believe that we need to arm ourselves with this background information to do the work well. Because from my um, from my experience and working with researchers across the board for a very long time, uh, people feel buffeted by funders and organizations and strong armed in particular ways of thinking and approaching impact, which aren't often um, meaningful for them or really equip them to, to showcase the power of the work that they're doing and the value that it brings into the world. But thank you for your reflection. I, um, I fully agree with all of that. And I think you've actually explained a lot of what the gibberish here at HMRC give us the right questions against is trying to get to. And I think having this is actually really, as you said, it's fundamental to understand how to, how to craft that selling of your work, if for want of a better word. So yes, I, I don't think it's been unnecessary. In fact, it's probably clarified a lot of what is, how we can do it. So it's been very good. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. So bravely, bravely moving forward into some of the more, I guess, kind of practical approaches to this then is, and I, and I think for, for us, you know, at, at, at the heart of this work is some very key questions that we can ask throughout the entirety of our research processes. Why are we doing this work? Why is this project needed and what are our goals? What knowledge or information needs to be shared? What are the objectives? What resources are required? Who do we need to engage? How will we understand the contexts in which we're working? How will we identify barriers and enablers of change? When will we implement the, the processes and the practices that we're going to be talking about and what indicators or measures will enable us to compellingly talk about the change that we've brought into the world. And the first point here, back to the, those kind of key ingredients for impact, is being very clear about the problem that our research addresses. What is the challenge that necessitates research funding, research questions and research responses? Why is this project needed? What questions will build understanding of the problem? What will be the impact if we succeed? And what will the change be? And who will the beneficiaries of that change uh, look like? Often in health and medical research contexts, we're kind of trying to, to achieve relatively consistent things. And these align with the NHMRC's perspective on impact, but also the AMRI uh, framework. Often people are trying to increase knowledge or awareness. We want to inform future research uh, attitudes, behavior, practice change uh, or, or technology adoption or generation. Uh, and one of the core tools to help us really start to unpick how our problem relates to outcomes and relates, relates to activities and outputs is program logic or theory of change. Uh, this is an extraordinarily straightforward but extremely helpful tool, which almost all of the impact frameworks uh, that, that are used utilize in some form. Uh, and what, what program logic does is boil a program of research or program of work down to its essence. It gets us to think about why we're doing the work that we're doing, who will be involved, how it will unfold, and fundamentally, what important changes uh, we're going to bring about. So, so bringing this into a little bit more um, kind of detail here, uh, it gets us to think about our inputs. So what you need or what you have to do your program of work. It then gets us to think about our activities, what you will do or what you will deliver. These are often the core research processes, your research methodology, your collaborations, your partnerships. Then we have our outputs, what we will produce or what we will deliver. Often these are uh, papers, reports, we'll have data, data sets, conference presentations, and so on. And then these flow on to short, medium, and longer term outcomes. Our short and medium term outcomes involve uptake and adoption of activities and outputs and the immediate consequences. And our short and medium term outcomes generally occur during the course of our project or upon immediate completion. And then these flow into longer term consequences, which is sometimes referred to as impact. Uh, outcomes and impact tend to be used interchangeably and confusingly. I, I 
don't see a, a particular distinction. Uh, really, the important distinction is uh, what we produce, you know, in terms of our products, and then the changes that, that, that those products bring into the world once we have adoption uh, and engagement. What program logic also importantly gets us to do is begin with a problem, necessitating investment, and our longer term outcomes should, in a powerful way, address or resolve a key element of that problem. Program logic also gets us to question our assumptions, so to ask why we think these things flow together in the way that we're thinking that they will here. What evidence are we drawing upon? What data do we have to suggest that this is a likely model that will flow in a logical way? And importantly, as we've talked about before, it gets us to situate our work in a particular context and acknowledge in full detail uh, all of the external factors that may likely facilitate or impede our impact because we are uh, working within particular rich contexts. And if we are wanting to see change in the real world, there will be a whole range of factors outside of our control uh, that, that we will have to contend with and that may uh, affect the success of our initiatives. This is the action part of the model. As I mentioned before, this is the impact part of the model. So program logic helps us bring together uh, a focus on potential impact. It provides a clear way of planning for impact. It helps us communicate about what matters to the project or the initiative and provides a structure for thinking and learning about impact. What impact also does is make explicit what is within and outside our control. So what we are really only in control of uh, are our activities and our outputs. Uh, we are, this, this is the kind of the work that was in, is really within our wheelhouse. In terms of our impact, we only really exercise indirect control uh, over these uh, elements. So I think this is also something that we need to keep in mind as we progress in this work. What program logic also gets us to do, or gets an, enables us to do, is create a framework for assessing our impact. So once we've articulated the change we want to see and how we'll achieve it, we can measure progress uh, and develop assessment questions and indicators. So in terms of our input, we can ask, were these inputs sufficient? And we can start to develop indicators around these. In terms of our activities, we can ask, did we do or deliver as we planned? And did engagement occur? In terms of our outputs, we ask, what did we produce? How many? What? And then in terms of our short-term outcomes, we can start to think about our reach and access indicators, the number and the percentage uh, of beneficiaries, uh, of training participants, of collaborators, uh, of general stakeholders who had improved awareness or skills or knowledge, whether things were applied, whether practice changed, and what barriers and enablers we were able to assess in the course of our work. And then in terms of longer term outcomes, I would be encouraging you to link these back to those broader domains, the NHMRC and the Association of Australian Medical Research Institutes frameworks talk to. How much was knowledge improved in a broad level? Did we increase research capacity? Was decision making at a high level affected? Did health improve? Did, when were there economic and social benefits? So I think as a fundamental take home, as a fourth tool in our impact processes, impact uh, is, is generally very well affected and, and, and influenced by program logic processes. Program logic helps us begin with the end in mind to select activities that are known to be effective, to identify goals and strategies to achieve impact, to communicate our vision, to manage expectations, and to monitor and evaluate our progress. Uh, and, and I have a whole range of resources that I can share with you to think about this in, in, in more um, and structured ways. So just to recap here now, research impact refers to the changes or benefits arising from our research. Program logic is a useful tool to help us conceptualize a pathway to impact. And knowledge translation and implementation planning processes and strategies move us along that pathway. So I'm, I'm not going to pause for questions there because we, we're almost at the end and I'm just going to cover this last section because it's also quite important and then we'll have some questions at the end. But the other kind of core a practical and, and strategic thing that you need to be thinking about doing if you're wanting to make a difference is involve your stakeholders early and often. And you need to ask some very particular questions here. Who's affected by your work? Who has an interest in it? Who's likely to benefit? Who may use your changes? And who importantly may oppose your work and what might be threatened? Engaging in, stake, in involving stakeholders 
uh, it leads to better quality research. It helps us improve our understanding of issues, of the context of change, of the mechanisms for change, and the research questions that are going to be most important for us to ask. It makes it much more likely that research will be relevant and acted upon. And importantly, and I think fundamentally, it is increasingly seen as the ethical way to conduct research, especially if that research is publicly funded. There is a growing awareness and consensus that people who are affected by research have a right to have a say in what and how publicly funded research is undertaken, and that people who use health services and or live with a health condition can and do provide a different and valuable perspective to research because of their personal knowledge and experience of research topics. And for all of these reasons, uh, involving uh, and incorporating and engaging our stakeholders make it much more likely for us to have an impact. When we're thinking about engagement in research, we often talk about a spectrum, and, and, I, and I encourage you to just to look at the central diagrams here. Uh, this isn't to say that this is a hierarchy of value or kind of from, from not so good to very good. There are different ways and different reasons for engaging in different forms and at different levels at different parts of our research projects. Uh, but this is generally a way that it's been conceptualized. So level one, informing is that kind of broadcast model. It's monodirectional. It's us speaking to an audience. Level two, gathering information. We are asking a question and we're receiving a response, but we may not be replying. Level three, we're seeing a dialogue. We're asking questions, we're receiving responses, and then we're, we're feeding back. Level four is engagement. So we, we've got that mono, we've got that bi-directional conversation, but we are also then facilitating conversations amongst stakeholders. And level five, this partnership model, uh, the, the key factor here that has changed is the power differential. We are no longer driving the process, but we are one amongst equals. Now, addressing those power imbalances in ex is, is, is much more uh, complex and difficult uh, in, in practice than in theory. Um, we can have a conversation about that if that would be of interest. But this is the way engagement is often conceptualized. Uh, this is really expanding upon that model of an engagement spectrum. And so this uh, is a, a table that may be familiar to many of you. It's used often um, uh, in, when talking about stakeholder and community and consumer engagement. This is an adapted version of the International Association of Public Participation spectrum of stakeholder engagement. And what I like about this model is it makes the commitment to stakeholders at each level very explicit. So in terms of inform, we will keep you informed. In terms of consult, we will keep you informed, listen to you, acknowledge your views and provide feedback. In terms of involve, we will work with you, consider your views and provide feedback on how your input influence the outcomes. In terms of collaborate, we will look to you for advice and innovation in the formulation of solutions and incorporate your advice to the maximum extent. In terms of empower, we will implement your decisions and support, your, uh, support and complement your actions. It also provides a range uh, of, of indicative, by no means exhaustive methods for engagement in each of these levels. Uh, and I think helpfully challenges the sometimes um, only conception that you, we just need a reference group or an advisory group to, to kind of inform us that that's not the only way that these need to, to work. There is a very active conversation at the moment uh, across the Melbourne Children's Campus around co-design. And I would say that co-design fits uh, kind of across the involve, collaborate and empower part of the spectrum. If we are looking to work in indirect partnership to really inform uh, the conceptualization, the prioritization and the design of our projects, that's where we're, we're aiming for here. Now, I'm conscious of time, but I, I just wanted to quickly uh, look at this particular diagram. And so often researchers say to me, well, look, I, I would like to engage more, but I'm not quite sure at what point and why and what the intended value would be at different points of a research uh, program. And so here uh, at the center of, uh, of, the, of the slide, we see um, a relatively straightforward and traditional research process. And I'll quickly go through some intended outcomes uh, and, and opportunities at each stage for greater engagement. In terms of identifying and prioritise, the opportunity here is that stakeholders inform uh, and are consulted about, about our priorities. The outcomes here is that the proposed, proposed research is more relevant and meaningful. In terms of the design and planning, the opportunity is that stakeholders clarify research questions and affirm their importance and co-design approaches. And the outcomes is that the study design and the plan is rigorous, relevant, collaborative uh, and more likely to be impactful. 
In terms of developing the research or grant proposal, the opportunity is that stakeholders can be co-applicants. They can help ensure that the research is eth ethical, engaged and nuanced, and that opportunities for ongoing involvement are identified and actioned. And the opportunities at this stage is that research uh, is high quality and ethical and, and more likely to appeal to a range of funders. In terms of undertaking and managing research, the opportunity here is that responsibilities are collaboratively identified and shared, issues are anticipated and acted upon, uh, and stakeholders can share their insights and wisdom throughout the process. And the outcome anticipated here is that processes and methods are ethical and effective, but there's better recruitment, higher quality data, and the capacity of research stakeholders in the research system is enhanced. In terms of analysis and interpretation, the opportunities is that stakeholders contribute here and the outcomes is that relevance of data is maintained, stakeholders and community are respected and protected, particularly if there aren't any, um, so that the data is analysed in an ethical and, 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 and reasonable way uh, and, and the results are more legitimate. In terms of dissemination and implementation, the opportunity here is that stakeholder input enables uh, much more effective dissemination and implementation. And the outcomes is that we have and see a greater impact. And in terms of monitor and evaluation, the opportunity is that our stakeholders will help us maintain focus and momentum and assist if issues arise. And the outcomes are that research stays on track, is more accountable, uh, and, and that that cycle of collaboration and co-design continues in a way that enriches not only our research, but the change that our research can generate in the world. Now, the only thing that I'll add here is that it is unlikely that anyone will be able to do all of this at any one point, but what I hope this does is highlight that that you don't have to engage at just one point for one purpose, but there are multiple opportunities and reasons for engaging and whether or not you're at the identify and prioritize part of this research spectrum or, or anywhere else along here, there is still an opportunity for you to engage uh, maybe more readily for greater impact. So I'm gonna stop here now and, and just kind of end with some closing reflections before, before I let you all go off into your days. But, but really I hope what, what I've been able to show here is that rather than approaching impact by assessment only, it is much more uh, meaningful and probably much more fruitful an exercise to approach impact by design and impact as a mindset, getting to the core values as to why you're doing the research uh, and, and really outlining that throughout the course of your research project. I'd like you to uh, reflect that research rarely causes change directly, rather research influences and contributes to change in rich and complex ways. And that complexity does raise challenges, but please don't be overwhelmed by these. The perfect may be the enemy of the good when we're talking about research impact, uh, but it is perfectly fine and probably most feasible for you to start small and iterate and build over time. As I've spoken about just now, it's important to involve your stakeholders at all stages. All of the, re uh, all of the research evidence suggests that this is necessary. Uh, and if you are thinking about impact assessment, be careful about attribution and be clear about your purpose. And remember that learning and improvement is, is just as important an outcome uh, of research uh, as, as any other impact indicator. Remember that there are excellent tools, templates and resources uh, to guide us in this work and, and I will be able to share a whole range of things after today. Um, but then taking a step back, I would encourage you uh, to think that cynical approaches to impact undermine trust in research. Often our institutions and our funders can inspire uh, through their what seem like arbitrary and difficult demands of us, cynical approaches. But if we are cynical about the change that we want to see and are seeing in the world, that that does uh, undermine trust in our research efforts in, in general, and that, that suits nobody. Um, and finally, uh, just encourage you to consider that we are the research culture we seek to co-create. And so if things do seem uh, unreasonable or weird or biased or not particularly effective around research impact, I think we all have a role as a research community to advocate for meaningful change within our organizations uh, and, and with funders to ensure that when we are talking about impact, we are talking about things that are meaningful uh, and responsible and ethical for us and our stakeholders. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, and I hope this has in some way informed uh, your understanding and enriched your approach to research impact. Thank you, Ken, for that wonderful overview of an, what is usually an eight part workshop. Was that right? So that was fabulous. It's an eight part program. So it, it, it has been, I, I apologize if I have um, dazed you somewhat with the <laughs> onslaught. Oh, no, that was fabulous. Thank you. And certainly what, what I really am, am, am hearing there is that impact is more than just my metrics. Um, to, to be aware of that impact 
washing. Um, but really to remember that this is value-driven research. So to really go back to that beginning and think, you know, what is the change or benefit that we're looking for from our research? So um, that came across really beautifully and, and I thank you for that. Um, now, this will be um, recording, I mean, obviously there's a lot of information there, so we'll put this up on the Opus website. Um, and we'll have a link to some of the other resources that you also mentioned there too, Ken. Um, so we will um, make sure that we distribute that to the group. Now, before we do race off, we've got a minute left. We do have a lovely question here from an anonymous um, person. Uh, how can you address power imbalances in research between researchers and participants? Ken, do you want to quickly try to nip that one in the bud? I think it's, it's, it's an extremely important question, and I think that there is no one easy answer. I think it's about giving the, the adequate time and space to ensure that you both can uh, incorporate uh, meaningful feedback from your stakeholders, but that you're also very clear about the expectations from the outset. I often see um, people trying to engage in uh, co-design processes when they have very limited scope to incorporate any feedback they might receive from uh, research users and research stakeholders. So I think being clear about what your purpose for engagement is, and then being clear about to what extent you can meaningfully hand over power or share power with different stakeholders is the, is the key necessary um, uh, first step. There is also great training in this space. And so I think if you are wanting to work in a more participatory and engaged way, I would very strongly encourage you to seek some upskilling for yourself and your team. And so we can also share some, um, some additional resources for who to, who to go to and who to speak to if you'd like to do this in a more concerted way. Fabulous. Thank you, Ken. And we also have in the pipeline um, a little bit later in the year, a presentation from of our own um, community and consumer involvement program at Opus. So um, please keep an eye out for that and we'll be disseminating that link to everybody as well. So thank you again. And um, we'll let everyone sign off. We're just after 11. So um, Ken, big thanks to, to you and to everyone for coming along today. And um, yeah, links will be disseminated by uh, Michelle or Manny after this. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.